a lot of people that are leaving the organization and the reason that they're lost is because they feel that they're worthless. And that's a psychological thing. That's that's done to us on purpose. That's why people are scared to get kicked out. That's why people are scared to leave. Because without the organization, they feel worthless. And that's by design. Keenan Jerome Floyd is a writer, producer, and comedian based in Los Angeles, California. He hosts a podcast called Dangerously Awkward, where he talks about trying to make it in the entertainment industry while dealing with his hangups of being an ex-Jehovah's Witness in a chaotic world. You're listening to The Critical Thought, where we challenge our listeners to use critical thinking when examining the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses. Hi, this is Lady C. Hi, this is JT. Hi, I'm Keenan Floyd, and I currently reside in Los Angeles. And welcome to another episode of The Critical Thought. You know, Keenan, we, we're glad that we were able to get you on the show today. Um, we enjoy having people on the show who are able to share with our audience what their experience has been in terms of being involved with the Jehovah's Witnesses. And, you know, just jumping right into it, uh, could you share with us how you became and your family became involved with Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, I personally, I was born in to the religion. A lot of people know, know what that means, meaning my, my parents and my family were already practicing Jehovah's Witnesses by the time, you know, I came. Um, prior to that, my both of my parents actually met at Tuskegee University in the late 60s. And my mother was a witness at the time because her family were witnesses, but my father was not, right? And they actually met when my mother knocked on his door. So over time, he started studying and all that stuff. And then at the end of uh, the decade, they got married. In 69, they ended up getting married. Uh, My father got baptized shortly after that. And um, I believe my father became an elder in 1973. It was either 73 or 74, right? So by the time I was born in the early 80s, you know, they had already, my mom and my dad already had a decade or so working working full time for the organization. So, um, you know, I, I, grew up familiar with field service. I grew up familiar with the meetings. It's basically all that I spent time with just witnesses. All my friends were witnesses. And um, at that time we were living in Mobile, Alabama. That's where I was born. And then about, when I was about six or seven, we moved up north to Pennsylvania. And in Pennsylvania, that's where I got baptized. I was about I think I was 12 or 13, I believe, when I got baptized. And it's interesting how much pressure you feel when you're in a family that's doing well in the organization, so to speak. Like, for for example, my father had been an elder since the 70s, right? Um, And as long as I can remember, my father always had some type of privilege on top of being an elder. So it was like the, being an elder. And then, you know, it, it, it's it's like, okay, well, you're in charge of the cleaning department at the convention now, or you're in charge of the lunch preparation. Back then, they actually had the lunches and stuff at, at the assemblies. Um, or it was giving talks um, at the conventions and at the assemblies and stuff like that. And my mother was a regular pioneer for as long as I could remember. So it was it was one of those things where it's like both of my parents were doing well, relatively speaking, in the organization at the time. And they also gave up like they also gave up a lot of um, worldly pursuits as well. You know, my my father went to medical school and all that stuff after going to Tuskegee and Fisk and all that stuff. But he gave all that up to 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 be a full time evangelizer. So. I always grew up in that in that mindset of doing well in the organization, right? And doing well in the organization equaled spirituality. That's what it is. That's what they that's what they teach you. The privileges that you get equals the, your spirituality and your dedication to Jehovah. 
So um, after I got baptized, I a, f- a few years later, after I got out of high school and after I fit, was going into college, um, I ended up taking tech courses at college for computer uh, computer um, uh, science and IT and all that stuff. Because back then, they really didn't encourage going to university, but they weren't against going for practical skills. They they changed that shortly afterwards, but back then you could still go without without much um, pushback. So around that time, I started saying, okay, well, maybe I'll get involved in foreign language. So I got involved in Spanish. I did Spanish congregations. And that's when I was uh, appointed a ministerial servant when I was doing Spanish, right? Then after that, um, a few years after doing that, I decided to move to the Dominican Republic to be a need grader, right? And then there, I went to ministerial training school. You know, I was appointed an elder. Um, up until that point, I had done temporary service at Bethel and stuff like that as well. So the influences that I had around me were always pushing me towards being a career Jehovah's Witness, basically. My parents, we went to Bethel every year. They had friends that were in Bethel. They had friends that were circuit overseers. My cousin had been serving at Bethel for a while. He's still there. As a matter of fact, he's been there for, for at least two decades almost. So it just seemed natural for me to, well, what's the next step? What can I do? Okay, foreign language. Okay, moving where the knee is greater in another, in another country. Um, so basically, that's how the first 30 years of my life basically like took shape. Yeah, so you basically were a career, full-time service-oriented type person. That You were achieving all the goals that the organization tells us that we need to be achieving. Everything is, can, it, 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 it boils down to do more, do more, jump higher, jump higher, run faster, run faster. Yes. And that's what you were doing. Uh, I do have a question. You mentioned that your dad was, was, uh, had, was involved in medical training. Was he at one time looking to become a doctor or something of that nature? Or Yeah, that was his original plan. Um, and anyone knows anything about getting a, a doctorate or, or going to medical school, you have to go to school for a long time. Um, I, I, the way my dad did it was he went to Tuskegee and Fisk before being accepted to John Hopkins. So basically, he set out he set out to be a doctor and he was doing everything that he could to do it. My dad was, is a very smart man. Like he did very well in school. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that to be like a bragger. I'm just saying this is, this is what he gave up when he yes. decided. Yes. To be a joke. No, so yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. He, he gave up a lot. Yeah. What, what career field did he end up in? He, so he had a few jobs uh, before I was born. He worked a lot in chemistry. So he was a chemist at Kodak. But by the time I was born, he was a chemist for international paper. Um, and he actually invented a few patents for the paper making process um, that I think he still, you know, I think he still benefits from today. So most of my life, he, he started off as a chemist at International Paper. He ended up moving up to being a manager, I think, in their, ke- their, their chemical department or something like that. Um, and then eventually he retired from International Paper and ended up becoming a medical accountant before retiring again. Yeah. Your, your dad's situation is the unique Jehovah's Witness situation. And we often see this is oftentimes used by others, when someone says something about higher education, they will often say, well, you know, Brother Johnson, he went to college there and so forth. But, you know, it's always interesting when you ask, typically, when you ask about the man who went to college, you will find that in most cases, in most cases, they actually went to college before they became one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So whatever benefit they're getting in terms of career, because like, like your dad was able to work basically a Jehovah's Witness gravy job. Uh, we know exper- experiences of uh, two sisters who were, they were CPAs and they went to work for an accounting firm and they split the job two ways. 
but because of what CPAs make per hour, they both were able to work part-time jobs, making what the average witness was probably making, who was working 12 hours at night in some cleaning McDonald's and some bank. And so it's not the same. Uh, if you have those extra uh, training, you can get better level jobs. Uh, like we see with the COVID right now, uh, witnesses are being impacted because most witnesses end up in some type of service-oriented job. And that's just the way, based on your skill set, that's what you will probably end up with many times. And so um, your dad, like you said, y'all guys were able to live a pretty basic good life because your dad had basically a good job with benefits, which he got those training skills before he became a witness. Yeah. Now, were you ever encouraged to go to college yourself? by like teachers and people like that who were around you who saw what you were able to do in school? That's an interesting question because um, I, okay, so so a couple questions. Yes and no. Yes and no. And I'll explain yes. Yes, because every teacher is supposed to encourage their students to go to college. I think that's my law. <laughs> I think... <laughs> I, I especially, think legally, especially yes, and especially if you, especially if you uh, demonstrate uh, certain type of scholastic scholastic aptitude. They, that's that's what it is. If yeah. you have the scholastic aptitude, they will encourage you. Yeah, I think legally they're supposed to encourage you to go to college, right? So you know there was all you know the guidance counselor asked you what you wanted to do and all that stuff, you know. And I said, "Why well, what?" to do i wanted to go to film school and all that stuff and everything so it's kind of like i tried to align myself to go to film school and stuff like that right so from school yes i was encouraged to uh go to college however i also say no because the town that i grew up in where i went to school was more like a country town you know what i mean kind of yeah. kind of hillbilly-ish type town where the school was good, but it was a lot of people that, that work with their hands, you know what I mean? Which is great. But um, so a lot of there's there's a lot of technical schools. There's schools where it has like farming degrees. There's schools where it's like auto mechanics, Te you know, technical, pra practical, technical schools. So it, it, it was one of those things where it's like, OK, we encourage you guys to go to college. But at the same time. If you never leave town, yeah. you know, it's not, it's not yeah. the biggest deal. Yeah. You know what go, I mean? Go, go, go to school for something you can use in a new system, they should tell us. You know, that's, that's exactly right. So it's like, if you could go to college and get a degree in window washing, they would be like, yes, absolutely. You know, get, get an associate's in window washing. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is. So, 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 yeah, it's it, it it was both, but but like I said, back then, and when I say back then, I'm only talking the early 2000s. Yeah, there was, and I and I don't know if you guys remember this. I'm sure you do, but there was an encouragement of witness youth to go to technical schools after college. They yes. they specifically said that they said go to technical schools, get technical courses, get get degrees in technical things. So that you can use that to get a job. That's what they said. And then what was it? Five years later, they they like stopped it. They're like, nope, no education outside of after high school. Like they changed it afterwards. The tone changed. I remember when the Watchtower article came out and it made the specific point that whether someone goes to college or not, basically is the brothers and sisters own business, leave them alone. That's their decision. And then it kind of morphed to where, well, you can go to college if you're going to use it to pioneer. If you're going to use it to take care of yourself for the ministry. And the reason I remember this is because I was an elder in the circuit of we had. He actually specifically told us in one of our elders meetings, he said, you know, everybody in the kingdom, the circuit overseers were writing in, in their reports. We got all these kids going to college and claim they're going to pioneer out. They finish college and get that doctor's degree and that kind of crazy stuff. And at that point, the society basically came back and clamped back down. And so it, it kind of moves, it kind of moves up and down depending on who the governing body members are and depends on the attitude of those guys who are writing the articles. And so you get this, 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 this crazy message throughout the organization. But basically at, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, a Jehovah's Witness child is not going to be encouraged to go to college. Interested in 
interested in knowing about is, you know, you said you, you did foreign language. And so, yeah. you know, I lived in Puerto Rico as a kid, but I didn't live there long enough to pick up the language. So my question to you is, how much of the language did you pick up living overseas? Most of it. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not saying that I'm the best uh, Spanish speaker, but um, I remember when I first went to the Dominican Republic, I really didn't know that much Spanish because being in the uh, a Spanish congregation in the United States, we spoke English before and after the the meetings. So it was just like during the meetings we would speak uh, we would speak Spanish, right? But in the Dominican Republic, when you're actually in the thick of it, you have to figure it out just to survive. So I remember one time I was in the middle of a baseball field uh, a week in, and I'm like, what am I doing here? This is like, I don't know Spanish. I don't know, like, I don't know how I'm going to make it, right? So after that, I basically had to push myself to learn the basics. Food, what, food items. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay, so food, I know that. Uh, I need to learn basic words about rent. In housing, I need to learn that stuff. Um, How were you with money? If you don't understand the changes in money, you could end up giving them a twenty. They give you back a two dollar bill, you know. Oh no! I mean, I didn't know Spanish. I wasn't stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I de I definitely I definitely learned the exchange rates and all that stuff. The dollar goes very far in the Dominican Republic. I learned that you could get in the Dominican Republic, you could get housing, nice housing for a quarter of what you get in Atlanta. Wait, where, where do you guys live? We live in D.C. Okay, well, well okay. I don't know much about rent. In it's about like Atlanta. It's about like Atlanta, probably. It's a, it costs more to live here than it costs there. Really? It's yeah. Than, it's more expensive in the D.C. area than Atlanta. In Atlanta, so so basically, let's say let's say you're you're spending a thousand bucks on rent, right? Some areas, like in Pennsylvania, you can you can get an apartment, one bedroom for seven fifty, yeah, a month, right? In a Dominican Republic, you could rent a house for between two twenty five, wow, a month, and even on that end, people are like, oh, that's expensive, because you know. Cause, cause what I noticed about serving with the knee is great is that they really want you to, they really encourage you to kind of fit in with the other brothers and sisters so that there's no hard feelings, I guess you could say. Cause basically what, what, what I noticed is they don't want the friends that are there to be jealous of you. Right. So you might say, Oh man, I'm getting a house for like $300. This is amazing. But like to them, that's like, access it's like you're getting excess you know what i mean like it's like you're getting a house and you're just by yourself and it's it's four thousand pesos which is only three hundred dollars but it's a lot of money down there you know what i mean or seven thousand pesos so i'm sorry seven thousand pesos is like two hundred dollars right so i mean I forget exactly what the question was, but the, 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 the thing is I learned Spanish through daily life, right? And then what was nice about actually serving in the congregation was your vocabulary is extended because now you're going over scripts in Spanish. You're yeah. going, you know, you're going over talks, you're going over presentations, you're going over field service. You you know you're reading the literature, the literature, the magazines, and the books and stuff in Spanish because you have to teach people in that language. So I mean, by the end of the day, by the time I left, you know, I understand Spanish a hundred percent. Maybe I'm eighty nine, ninety two percent fluent in Spanish. I mean, I still have a thick my accent, my neutral accent. So at what point then? Because now here you are serving as an elder. You've gone through the Watchtower Society Ministerial Training School. So you come into town with some serious credentials, organizationally speaking, um, which means you will probably be given a lot of privileges that local brothers would wait for years to get. You'll be up there giving public talks or 
handling all mm-hmm. kinds of assignments that local brothers would not get. So just by default, because I know when I was at Bethel, just by default, you become quote unquote prominent, just by default. So at what point did someone who is involved at this level in the organization beginning to question things? I think for me, and I think you alluded to this earlier, when you start moving up in the organization, you start seeing things. And that's when you start realizing that everybody in this organization are human and they have human feelings. And when I say human feelings, I almost mean corporate feelings. Like when you go up, when you go up the ladder, the more pressure you get on yourself. When I got more privileges, I got more stressed out than I had ever been stressed in my life. And a few of those reasons was I was single in the Dominican Republic. Um, I was young as well. There was, I I think there was like a, I think there was like a sense of arrogance that I had too because I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. So I probably came off a little know, know it all you know what I mean? So it's one of those things where people start taking opportunities to humble you, right? Yes, yes. And, and you're supposed to accept it. I mean, being humble is very important, but I also think, th- I'm like, this is borderline becoming hazing. You, you, you know what I mean? I see, yeah. It, they they, yeah, take, they take turns. They throw darts at you. Yeah, so it's like I accomplished something and I'm not allowed to be happy that, or proud that I accomplished something. I have to immediately just be humble. And so what happens is you start, you start getting those feelings where you're like, well, how come I have to be humble and brother so-and-so is blah, 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 but he's arrogant and he's this and that, but he gets all the, he gets to do everything. Yeah. But I have to clean the toilets because I'm too arrogant or whatever, right? Yeah. So the human when the human feeling came into it, that's when I started I and I wasn't outright questioning, but I was like, I'm not sure if this is as divinely ordained as they are leading us on to believe. Yes, yes. You you know what I mean? Absolutely. Because, because you, begin, we, you begin to see a side, you begin to see a side of the organization that people normally don't see because they are not in those echelons. And what you see is, like you said, um, it becomes more corporate than spiritual. You, you, there's a part where you, where you cross the line where everything becomes political. Like, like yes. once you once you cross that line into the politics of the organization, you can never go back. No, you can never unsee how that works on that side. So you know, I know there's a lot of people that that understand what we're saying. Yes, it is, and this is important that we tell this story because see, this is the part of the organization that is not to be seen. When I was at Bethel, they used to tell us point blank, when you go back home for the summer, don't you be telling anybody what's going on here at Bethel unless it's something nice. Yeah. So people, and so I, and and so when I would go back to North Carolina, there would be people who would ask, can you see the governing body? Can you talk to them? And so this whole air of of, of mystery and, 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 and intrigue they wanted to keep it going. They, they want you to keep it going. Uh, they wanted you to keep it going that brothers, as they move up, they walk on water, as it were. But you knew Bethel is getting drunk, running women, all that kind of stuff. You could be telling people about that that because that, that wasn't what they wanted people to know. But yet that was the truth. <laughs> well, uh, too, that, because the, just being married to JT and the, the little peak that I saw... <laughs> is the reason why I could walk out the door when he left because of the things I saw, like what you said, political. I saw that too. Well, I'll give you a step further. I'll give you a step further. As a brother, you are encouraged to go to Bethel and go to MTS to get women. To get women. I am not, I am not making this up. 
when when you're because back then uh Minnesota Trading School was singles only. Single guys only. Single single men only. And basically they said they said they said okay well you you can't be married, dating, interested in anybody for like two years or something like that if you're gonna go to MTS, right? However, um, I, w- I wasn't interested in MTS here in the States, so I'm not exactly sure how it is here, but in the Dominican Republic, basically it's like every sister was like, MTS brother, M- MTS, we're going, we need, we need brothers from MTS. They, they, all of the volunteers that worked, cause, cause in, cause in um, the Dominican Republic, we had to stay in a compound. We didn't get a chance to stay like in people's homes, like they do here in the states. We actually stayed like on the assembly hall uh, property where they had the school, right? Army of sisters, sis- single sisters, will volunteer. <laughs> will volunteer to work the schools, and armies yeah. would make us lunch, do our laundry, uh, clean up the the classrooms, clean up the assembly hall, mow the grass. Whatever they could do, armies of these single old sisters were just there. And a lot of them went marry graduates. They would marry, the people would graduate. They would flirt here and there with, with the brothers while they're in school. They, and they would get married after they would graduate. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. You're human. Do what you got to do. That's amazing. That You meet people. But... I'm just, but I'm just saying that's like something that a lot of people don't talk about. They say when you get privileges, you basically can get any woman in the organization that you want. That's 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 how they really sell it for you. So what happens is, in my case, there's this feeling where you're like, well, I have to do this if I want to be worth something to these people. If I want to get a good woman. I need to be one of these guys. I need to be the MTS grad or like whatever, right? I need to be that guy. The Watchtower has its own version of Harvard. They have their own version of celebrities. They have their own version of, um, you know, upper class men, you know, top notch men. And that's what it is. That that was very similar to what we had at at Bethel as well. Um, and I remember we had we actually had some single circuit overseers who had attended um, MTS school, and man, the sisters they rode them. I mean, they rode them. I mean, I, you remember what that was? <laughs> One sister. Oh yeah, we oh, had man. we had a, we had a single circuit overseer, oh, and they were coming to the Kingdom Hall wherever he was giving talks or wherever he was serving the congregation that week, and. They would put uh, their phone number on his windshield. And I remember they were talking about how he was at a get together and they went up to him and said, oh, brother, can I butter your bread for you? They were just everywhere. Everywhere, man. I mean, people would get to the Kingdom Hall, man. And like you have you have like the first three, first two or three rows, man. First two or three rows, just single women. And the old folks be like, well, I know I'm in seven in the front, but all these little young sons up there, I, I'm gonna see this second school. I mean, man, it was funny, man. All I could, I mean, all I could do, man, was just sing my head like, Lord, have mercy, boy. <laughs> but, but I don't blame them. Yeah. When, the organization I, I, when, when they tell you, because this is how the organization does, when they tell you, they say, these are the type of people you should look for that make proper marriage rates in the organization. Unfortunately, those are few and far between, right? Like not, most people in the organization are not perfect. A single circuit overseer, get out of here. Yes. That is an MVP. That is the quarterback. <laughs> you're right. you, you, you are right, man. I mean, I'm, I'm, I saw, we saw this, man, because I had never seen a single circuit overseer. I'd never seen a single CO. I remember, I remember when we were when you were in the chairman's office that year. So oh, he oh, came. I remember oh, he came, man. and I kept saying, "He is so silly," and so people were saying, "Well, he's acting silly on purpose because he was trying to push the single sisters away." That was his way to get them out of his face. 
was like, why he acting like? Yeah, <laughs> it, it was bad, man. I mean, you we were up in the chairman's office, and so the circus, so he comes up there, sisters are outside, and like, I was just saying hello, I just say hello. And it was like, this is so sad. But that, like you said, this is what the organization does. I think one of the governing body member, just a year or two ago, he gave a talk, and he was talking to all the single sisters, and he made the point that if, if, if the brother you're looking at is not a ministerial servant, you ain't got no business looking at it. And you and I both know, and my wife, we often laugh about this, how call him a ministerial servant. I mean, you know, good husband. He might be, he might not even have a job, but he's a ministerial servant. He hands out little magazines at the end of the meeting. And you got a good right. brother sitting over here, a uh, good guy. And and but that's the way the organization is set up. That is the structure of the organization. Well, it used to be yeah. because there was and I became friends with one of them and they were getting very upset because a lot of the single sisters would come to Brooklyn to visit the brothers at Bethel and they would want to stay with those sisters. And they felt like their house was becoming a hotel for the single sisters to stay at. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it, it was just interesting to me, and, and I'm just saying this from like a single person's point of view in the organization. There was never really, because I think that I started maturing honestly after I got out, because I I almost feel like that there's not really encouragement of being, of having like a solid personality. Like for example, we talk about they say encourage single people to go after people with privileges. Go out with the, with the regular pioneer, go after the ministerial servant or single elder or whatever, right? But no one teaches brothers how to spit game. No one teaches brothers how to talk to women so that they feel good about themselves or that, you know what I mean? Or that they they necessarily make them feel special. Now, I'm not saying that that's, brothers don't know how to do that. There's plenty of brothers that know how to do that. There's plenty of good brothers and sisters that know how to make their spouse and their significant other, other feel great, like a million bucks. But there's not much, there's not much training. We get training in everything else, but there's not much training, I think, that that we really receive on how to get that far. And then sometimes people get into relationships, and then the relationships end up being horrible, but on the outside, it looks good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So. It's what we say is the criteria. I mean, for all practical purposes, the only thing that makes a brother good if, if he has high hours, attends all the meetings and comments. And the same thing with a brother looking for a wife. If, if she's a regular pioneer, then by definition, she must automatically be a good wife. And I know people, and you know people, my wife knows people, um, who they marry people basically on those grounds. And that's one of the reasons why we've observed too many times that when people realize this is not the truth, they leave their spouse because they're like, you know, I married you because you was a pioneer. You know, I, you know, that don't mean that no more. Oh, so now, um, basically now, so you were in the Dominican Republic for how long? Um, 10 years. 10 years. Wow, that's a long that's time. That's a long time, man. Yeah. And so when did you come back? What, did you come back after you left or before you? When, when did you wake up? While you were there or after you left? So I I was disfellowshipped in the Dominican Republic. Um, and my story was I ended up dating, I ended up dating a, uh, a girl from the town I was in. And, and to be honest with you, I don't really know why. I don't know why. I, you know, I, I, I dated like a couple sisters and, you know, I just ended up getting, you know, I just ended up getting caught up with just like a neighbor or something like that. Right. So I, for, for a while, I think they were, they were suspecting something. Um, first of all, I know they were looking at me the entire time I was in the Dominican Republic. You know, I mean, I knew, I knew that they were trying to, I knew they were trying to find something on me um, and they were getting suspicious. And I remember the whole time I was there, because like in the Dominican Republic too, within the congregation, culturally speaking, a lot of people are very gossipy. 
Oh, yeah. So, like, for, for years, people would gossip, and I think they would gossip about, like, me, even though I spent most of my time in the house. Or I spent most of my time, you know, with friends from the congregation or whatever, right? And it was interesting because um, this this is where it goes back to people being human, um, there was Eng- there was like an English congregation and stuff that was close by and other need graders. And I would spend time with the friends, but in my congregation, but I would spend more time with my friends that were also need graders, right? And it just felt like that there was this sensitivity where, and this wasn't like a rule, but, but a few um, special pioneers and stuff would talk to me and they would say, the friends are saying that you're hanging out too much with, your other friends and you're not hanging out with, with them. And they feel a certain type of way because they feel that all Americans and all foreigners hang out together or whatever. Right. So it's like, we would go to parties and stuff after the English convention and all that stuff. And then I think that's when it started. they started doing like those rump saying those rumblings about me for a while. Right. So then eventually, eventually um, when I actually started messing around with this girl, then that's when they were like, oh, we we have to get everything on this situation right now. You know what I mean? It was almost like, yeah. oh, it's... Huh? It, oh, yeah, it, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. This, it, it was, it this was is almost... Ju- this is juicy. This is juicy. This is juicy. It, it, it was almost like they were like, oh, it finally happened. You yeah. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, they were literally, oh, finally. This is yeah. the moment we've been waiting for. He 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 messed around, got with the girl, and now all we need is just the proof, and then and then we're we're off, we're off to the races, right? So for about a month or so, so there was a there was a local brother in my the one current gauge I was in at the time, and I ended up meeting this girl in Puerto Plata, which was like close by, and a. And he told me that he saw me, but he didn't say specifically when, right? So I think that was like the beginning of, I, you know what I mean? I, because he, to be honest with you, he didn't, really didn't like me. So I just think that was like the beginning of the downfall. I think he went and told, and then they said, okay, now we need to start doing an investigation, right? And that same week, miraculously, I lost my cell phone and my iPad. Wow. So I told I told the elders in my hall, I said, hey, if you guys are trying to call me, I apparently lost my cell phone in Puerto Plata because I don't have it. I don't know where it is, right? So a few days go by, and and they kept asking me, they said, did you find your phone? And I was like, no, I didn't. never found my phone, right? So we had an elders meeting about a few days after that, maybe like the next week after that. And then they had my phone and my iPad together. Wow. They, they both, they had both of my phone and my iPad. And basically they had went through my phone and found like my text messages and all that stuff and basically said, okay, well, we cost you. So, so now we got to do the judicial committee, right? So the, the entire time I'm basically in shock. I'm in shock the entire time, like that entire leading up to and it was 24 hours. So, like, the next day we had the Judicial Committee. We had the Judicial Committee. And then they decided to disfellowship me. And then for that first, that those seven days, I'm, like, in shock. I'm, like, oh, no, I'm getting, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm being, my whole life is basically being taken away from me at this point. And um, so, like, that, so, so after the shock ended up wearing off of being disfellowshipped, I started thinking. And I said, wait a minute, the way that they did it was pretty illegal. You, you know what I mean? Invasion oh, of privacy. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Right. I was like, wait, I was like, wait a minute. That's when I said, I'm not even sure Jehovah has anything to do with this. Because this feels personal. You know what I mean? Vendetta. This this actually hurts. I'm not interested in being a part of this. Why 
why does this why does this hurt so bad? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and when I say why does it hurt so bad, I'm not necessarily talking about I'm not necessarily talking about not being able to talk to my family and all that stuff. I mean, why are you trying to hurt me so much? I <laughs> I've been in this country. I've been in this country for 10 years by myself for 10 years, leaving my family, leaving my family, leaving my um, friends back home. I'm here trying to make new friends. I'm here learning another language and all that stuff. And it's like, yes, I sinned. But this hurts like like you're like if you're making an example out of me you you know what i mean i often tell people it's like the steel hand in the velvet glove it looks nice and soft on the outside until it hits you upside the head and that's well, the point that people know nothing about i mean the unfeeling um the, the, you have elders I, i've seen elders literally become almost giddy with catching someone. Um, when, when I was in New York at Bethel, um, you would hear about, they used to do party raids where they would have a circuit overseer, a couple of L's, they would raid parties. And when you listen to these guys talk, they would they would talk with such, such glee. We caught them, we caught them. What were they doing? They, they, would, listen, they would listen to the Ohio player. <laughs> The grand, grand master well, class, you know? and, and, and that's where it goes back to what we were talking about before. It's the human factor in the organization. Yeah. It's that's there's so many people that don't like you. There's so many people that don't like you, and what they do is they hide behind the rules of the organization to to get at you, like like. The reason I got this fellowship <clears throat> was because I got caught, but it got so it got to a point where I was going to get caught. If I messed up, I was going to get caught because it was we are going to we are we are waiting for you to mess up. And that's the way it felt like when I messed up, like everything came, everything like rained down, like like they had stored up and everything rained down. So, you know, from there, and then after that, you know, the whole thing, you know, I was selling my things and like people in the congregation came and bought my things and like, you know, they, you know, they took advantage, they took advantage of, of what, you know, they got what they needed and all that stuff. So then after that, I just left. What job what? did you have? When you were working in the Dominican Republic, um, did you work part-time or full-time? I worked part time. I, I uh, worked at a uh, school. I worked at a school teaching English, and my boss was actually a witness. Oh wow! Yeah, my boss was an elder. Yeah. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. Oh yeah. So now you, so now you come back to the states. Where do you go? I mean, because now that you're in a disfellowship state, a lot of the friends that you had, relatives, people who are still witnesses. Where do you set up home at when you come back to the States? I, uh, I came back to Pennsylvania and I saw my parents briefly because they picked, sorry about that. I saw my parents briefly because they picked me up from the airport and I settled in Allentown and Philadelphia for a couple of years. And after that, After that, I moved to New York City, and I was in New York City for a few years. Mm -hmm. Now, the caveat is that I actually started doing comedy when I was 15 years old, even when I was a witness, right? So when I got kicked out, I kind of said, well, here's an opportunity to kind of see where that goes. So I moved to New York to try to, like, build a comedy career. So when I lived in New York, you know, I worked, I was, I became an assistant manager at a comedy club. I also worked at Staples. 
I kind of worked on my craft a little bit more. And um, I ended up um, writing for a few TV shows. And that the only reason I ended up writing for TV shows is because I had met other comedians that were getting shows on Comedy Central. And I just would do punch up. So they would ask me to do punch up on their script. So then I started getting involved in writing. But keep in mind, before that, I wanted to go to film school. Remember, I wanted to go to film school when I got out of high school, right? I ended up uh, doing comedy, writing. After that, I soon moved up to LA, right? And the comedy thing really wasn't working that well. I wasn't really getting a lot of writing jobs in the industry. Okay, so I moved to I moved to LA, and then I ended up getting um, a job in IT and a visual effects company. All right. And once and once I got a job in a visual effects company, then I was making connections. I was making connections with other people, and I was and now I'm starting to be able to write my own stuff. Okay. And hopefully produce. Okay, excellent. So what about um when you say you, you were trying to were you trying to be a writer for comedy before you did stand up? Is that what you were trying to do? Um no, I was I went to just pursue comedy. Okay. And then and then coincidentally, then I started writing for friends that had shows. Oh, and okay. And coincidentally, I said, oh, you can put comedy and stand-up together. Like, you don't necessarily have to do one or the other. And then that's when I eventually made my choice. And I said, okay, well, I can write. And I can kind of get, com- I can do comedy. I can write. I can produce. I can use my skills. And all it was, it was just all of the arsenal that I basically built over time. Right? And I think that's the reason why it worked out for me is because even though I was heavily involved in the Jehovah's Witnesses, I was unknowingly building my art arsenal of skills. So by the time I so by the time I got this fellowship and then I came back to the States, it turned into, all right, now how can I use my I don't know how this is gonna work. I didn't know how it was gonna work. Because when I got kicked out and I moved back, I actually came back to where I started. I came back to Pennsylvania, right? And that was necessarily the wrong place to be because I was like, I don't, I don't really know. This isn't the place like for my skill set. You know what I mean? And I think that's how they get a lot of witnesses, especially in small towns like that, is you have skills, but there's no place to use it. And that's why it's easy for the elders to kind of use it against you and say, you know what, don't go to college because it's meaningless in the small town that we're in. Right. So I kind of had to like relocate and move the places that fit my skill set. And that's, that makes sense. that's kind of why I'm wh- where I'm at now. All right. What advice do you have for young people waking up or wanting to know what to do with their lives? Anything that you're passionate about, put that, put that first, whatever that is. Put that first because that's what's going to, that's what's going to drive you to become successful and also be patient because there's going to be a lot of hurt that's going to actually happen when you fade out or when you leave but you have to you have to set you have to once you set that goal it's going to be a lot easier to actually get over the initial hurt that you're going to feel that initial hurt that you're going to feel is going to be painful but as long as you have that goal at the end of the day it's going to push you through it. It's going to push you through it because what's happening is a lot of people that are leaving the organization and the reason that they're lost is because they feel that they're worthless. And that's a psychological thing. That's, that's done to us on purpose. That's why people are scared to get kicked out. That's why people are scared to leave because without the organization, they feel worthless. And that's by design. That's by You're design. Very, hey man, that that is that is the most powerful statement you can make. That's what we have always stressed that it is you need to understand it is by design. It is not 
happenstance. It is by design to make you feel worthless. Yeah, and what what are you what, what how did you handle the disfellowshipping? What you said you talked to your parents briefly, but how did you, you know, you coming from this uh, country, you've been there for 10 years and you come back to the States and you're talking about the differences of how much it costs to live in this country versus where you're coming from. So how did you get back on your feet financially? Um, I sold most of my stuff. I sold my car and all that stuff in the DR. I made about 10 grand from that. Um, before I left the country, I started looking for jobs. And eventually I was able to, I was able to get a job. I was a valet for a few years. So I got a job as a valet when I got back. That was enough for me to be able to afford my rent and all that stuff. The tips were amazing. And I, I just started off doing that. I was about, it was an easy job to get. You know, I mean, uh, the town I lived in was very economically reasonable. And I just kind of worked with it. But I still had my goal, though. So I was a valet. And then from there, I became a valet. I was valet for a restaurant. Then I became a valet for, for, a, uh, for a hospital. And then from there, I met... Well, I became a manager for the valet at the hospital. And then one of the kids that I managed, his father was the CEO of a fire alarm programming company. So then I got an interview with that company and then I moved on and did that job. I got fired from that job like two years later. And then I moved to New York. So I like saved enough money to be able to like go to New York. Plus I got fired and I got unemployment. So I had my saved up money plus my unemployment money. And then I moved to New York. And then from there, I just kept applying. And then eventually I got a job at Staples. And then I had a friend who worked at Caroline's, a comedy club in Times Square, who set me up with the interview there. So then I interviewed to work there. And then I got the job. So it's just people that I knew through comedy, through life. Yeah, that's good. Wow. That's just really so good. that's excellent. I think people can really uh, benefit from that. So how can people find out about your work and, and, and you know, you want to shout out your, your, your Twitter feed and your Instagram and all that? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter and TikTok at Keenan J. Floyd, K-E-N-A-N, J to the F-L-O-Y-D as in pink. Um, and um, that's it. I, uh, I, I'm currently in Phoenix, Arizona right now doing shows with Godfrey at the House of Comedy. By the time this episode comes out, the shows will be over. But you can follow, make sure you follow me on social media and also check out my website, KeenanJeromeFloyd.com, so you can see where I'm performing. And yeah, that's it. Yeah. Awesome. So have you had a chance to do any international work or you're mainly, mainly domestic right now? Um, yeah, I've, I've performed in London. In Excellent. Australia, but and I was supposed to, I was supposed to go to South Africa this year, but COVID killed that. Yeah, COVID so yeah. hopefully, within the next few years, well, this year, hopefully, this year, and hopefully the next year, you'll see me in South Africa, and hopefully back in London, and 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 hopefully Tokyo, Japan. Sounds good. So you're you're helping people to see that there, yes, there is life after Watchtower. <laughs> there is life after Watchtower. Yes. Well, Keenan, we want to thank you so much for being on our program. We, um, you know, are glad that you took time out of your busy schedule because I see you've been, you're on the road now, right? You're on your way to your show? I'm on my way to brunch. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because you have a show later on tonight, right? Yes. Tonight at 7 p.m. at House of Comedy in Sweet. Phoenix slash Scottsdale, Arizona. Fantastic. Right. Scottsdale. Okay, good. Excellent. Thanks for coming on the show. We appreciate it. And thanks for sharing your experience. Thank All you right. for having me. We'll see you later. Thank you. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See ya. Bye. See ya. Bye. This program was sponsored by Critical Thinkers.